Good afternoon and welcome to Ground Zero. Hi everyone. Hello. So I'm Vanessa Gomez Braid, the Associate Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life. What matters to me and why represents a creative solution to an important and often unrecognized problem in the university setting. It's that separation of intellectual life from personal and spiritual issues. So this series creates a space on our campus to have conversations about what it means to be human, about who we are, our hopes, our dreams, our challenges, our aspirations, and how we connect with one another and how we find meaning and purpose. Every presenter brings their own perspective to the question of what matters to me and why. Rather than lecturing on their area of expertise or research, we invite speakers to share insights from their life journey with us. We've been doing this program for nearly 20 years, and I feel lucky that each semester I get to share with all of you yet another Trojan voice. So, if you would like to nominate a member of the USC community to speak at a future event, please visit our website, that's orl.usc.edu, and um, you can also visit our website to view recordings of past speakers. And just so you know, it is an anonymous form, and so you, you don't have to tell us your name if you don't want to. Um, I don't know who nominated Professor Grimes, but um, I thank them for that. Before I introduce uh, our featured speaker, I'd like to tell you about a few upcoming events. Uh, most notably, uh, this month, we have, let's see here. Next Wednesday at the University Religious Center, Interfaith Activism, How We Change the World Together with Professor Najiba Saeed. She's an Associate Professor of Interreligious Education at the Claremont School of Theology. She's also a well-known um, interfaith activist here in Los Angeles, and so I invite you to come out for dinner with our Interfaith Council and to meet Najiba. This is co-sponsored by our Muslim Student Union and our USC Interfaith Council. And then another thing I'm in excited for is that on April 9th, we have uh, Dean Haven Linkirk, uh, Linkirk of the Roski School. She's going to be doing a Shibori workshop in the courtyard of the University Religious Center. And so you can come out, hang out with Dean Linkirk and myself as we do some Japanese resistance dyeing, and then take some fabric home to decorate, wear, and so forth. That is also a spiritual practice. So. If you are not on our mailing list already, please sign up at, that, uh, at the paper at the front door, and you can be sure to get more details on all of these events. OK. Sit back, relax, and prepare a question for our Q&A portion at the end. We'll be passing the microphone around at that time, so please raise your hand and wait until it reaches you. That way, everyone can hear your question. And if you haven't already, grab a sandwich. There's plenty of food onto our main program. Those of you who know me know that dance has played a special role in my life, connecting me back to my Philippine culture, but also solidifying my identity as Asian American. As a child of immigrants who was growing up in an urban setting, my sense of self and my confidence came through movement. So from those Filipino folk dance classes, then onto my street dance explorations outside our community center, dance has always been very important to me. So I'm always excited when a faculty from the dance school gets nominated to speak in this program. In 2018, we had the pleasure of Gloria Kaufman speaking in this series, and today we are in for another treat. I am excited to introduce you to Sabella Grimes. He is a professor of practice at the Gloria Kaufman School of Dance, specializing in hip hop, improvisation, dance history, and black vernacular dance practices. He is a choreographer, writer, composer, and educator whose work reflects his interest in physical and metaphysical efficacies of Afro-diasporic cultural practices. And as I was researching Grimes, I learned that LA Times had once described him as the Los Angeles dance world's best kept secret. And that he is considered one of the most imaginative and innovative artists in his field. He created and continues to cultivate a movement system called Funkamentals that focuses on the methodical dance training and community building elements. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Sabela Grimes to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we could. Let me get 
get the Don't bamboo. Don't play with me. <laughs> Feels so official. I'll be your tongueless speaker. I'll be your sacred freak. I'll be your shell top sneaker. Break dancing priest. I'll be your sugar loaf star trooper. Double coupon trick. I'll be your blue light draws. Hey, I'll be the you that fits. I'll be the you that fits. I'll be the I'll be your hardcore crony. I'll be your cosmic goon. I'll be your fishnet sequence. Double bubble vest in June. I want to hit you in your consciousness. Where your psychic mist. I want to. Lick your palm, hey, be the you that fits, be the you that fits, be the you, 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 love me, leave me, to love me. Once again, be something for nothing, or simply just pretend to be just be, let's be human, to be, mm, I'll be human once again. You see, rain showers sour mid-hour parades. Night, night comes speaking criminal darkness. We wave ghetto thanks on our way. Still smelling my dear smothered yard bird here. No, 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 here. Well, yeah, here in this cornerless spot in this womb universe. Sneak, peeking, creeping, a breath away from here they come. Shh. You see, grown folk, they sit in sacred power pools, rebuking Satan, engraving the fear of fire and brimstone into the dream world of little ones who's supposed to be sleeping, paying no mind to grown folk business. Soon I'm going to get me some more religion. See, right now, I practice the spirituality of crisis, a reactionary way to redefine and muster up old sins on my way in. I, <clears throat> I nod to deacon so-and-so, squeezing between deceit-spaced smiles. This aisle's OK, brother. Thank you. You see, I can show teeth without grinning. Don't win or lose, choosing silence over dismay from knee high to now. These folk know me to be happy, but never.
Will I keep my ways to myself and pray for a new religion and protection? Little lost shades of brown boy. Little lost shades of brown boy. Little lost shades of brown boy. I come in many tongue, undone between before and beginning. I am that 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 I am a soul creation, Nubian manifestation physically placed in this free will zone. Old soul ever young, alone, all one. Old soul ever young, alone, all one. Yo, you think I'd come and not stay long? I come, walking through the halls, eating hours, a ritual, shadows, bigger than people, blacker than, blacker than, blacker than, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yo, when I said blacker than, I, I kind of got like this feeling that one of y'all, somebody out there, when I said blacker than, I got this feeling that somebody thought I was going to follow that up with N-word. I want to know, just raise your hand. Who was it? When I said blacker than, you had the unmitigated gall. No overreaching audacity to think I was going to follow blacker than with N-word, who is it? Is it you? Who, you? You? You thought I was going to follow it up with, with N-word? Who, you? Yeah, me too. I was thinking blacker than N-word. Blacker than N-word. Blacker than inward, 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 inward. Blackest thought from which all is created. Y'all not, you not. Y'all yeah, not. You not. Y'all not hear me right. You not. Nah. What's up, y'all? How y'all doing? I have to like, what the flip? How y'all doing? <laughs> Dang. You guys don't know where it ends and where it begins, huh? There, there is no beginning and there is no end. Um, really fortunate to get a chance to uh, share a little vitamin G with you all. I um, had this crazy thought this morning, like what the flipping hell am I doing? What did I sign up for? I can talk about so many different things and in a moment, if something seems applicable, I can talk about some experience that I've had, but to stand and talk about me is, is challenging. Um, but I'm going to do it anyway, because I'm here, and I want to honor your time and presence. Um, so that is a little bit of a sample pack from some of the creative experiences that I've had a chance to give birth to over the past. 15, 20 years, uh, and in doing that, it, it, it helps me prep, it helps me reconnect and recalibrate to these streams of thought, um, and thought in this case isn't necessarily just a cerebral sort of thought, but like these thoughts that my body have and all of my bodies, my emotional, mental, spiritual, etheric, soul, collective, communal bodies that flow and circulate within me. And it was really nice. I usually rehearse in the shower. That's like my main place. Um, and I was thinking this morning, what matters most to me is to live out loud in a way that I feel like 
is steeped or saturated in integrity. And integrity in this case is where I toe the line of what's honorable for myself and very clearly thinking about how I am an extension of my foremothers and fathers that really gave birth to this moment for me and many moments that I've experienced in this lifetime. <clears throat> how, do I, how am I honorable about the people in my community that I care for, my kin folks, both blood and chosen or soul family, um, the beautiful people that I get a chance to share space with in a dance studio or a lecture hall here and in other places in the world, like this, these sort of like ways that I feel extended in this womb universe is really important for me. Um, another thing has been to be openly black, which is like super frightening. Um, there's a constant negotiation about this way of being in the world. Um, because unfortunately I know how to read and I've read a lot and there's been so many instances where people that look like me or come from communities of people that look like me, if they dared be open about loving themselves, they were met with a full spectrum of violence. Um, and I guess the most recent sort of evidence would be here in California. They passed the, uh, in th this year, the Crown Act. You guys familiar with the Crown Act? Ever heard of it, the Crown Act? Yeah? Where, you know, it's now illegal to discriminate against people that just allow their hair to grow the way it naturally grows out of their head. I know that sounds so simple, right? But in 2020, in the state of California, they passed that law. And that's amazing. And it's so connected to this institution. It's so connected to the day before I, I was going to say audition. I didn't audition for this job. What did I do? I interviewed for this job. <laughs> I had a mohawk, and I'm like, damn, what am I going to do? Am I going to shave this off to look? You know, I had all these ideas of what USC is like. And in my head, all I saw was blue and gray suits and people that talk like this. Um, and I was like, ah. And I was like, bruh, this is me talking in the mirror, bruh. You just, you just got to, you just got to. And I recall something that one of my mentors, uh, Robin Heineke in Philly, um, who's a white minister that I worked for this uh, so social justice organization. And I was like young and I would just give him the business. Like, what are you doing in the hood? What are you doing? And um, one time I was being a little belligerent at his dinner table after I was invited to, to dinner, but just kind of poking and just having this sort of back and forth. And I remember challenging him on something. He said, well, you know, you know Delvin, which is my first name. He was like, um, I believe in presence over perception. And it was literally like, Phew. yeah. And so coming into the interview, I thought, <clears throat> presence over perception. And presence isn't necessarily about what I wore, what I wouldn't, wasn't going to wear, but really about being present and steeped in the multiple reasons why I felt like I was the one for the gig. The multiple reasons why I felt that if I apply for this grant, that this project is valuable and there's multiple audiences for it. There is something in this project that people will receive. And people will receive in a way that there's this reception in the spirit of reciprocity. They'll receive something and want to give something back. They'll receive something and want to pay it forward. 
themes like masculinity, malehood, manness, uh, my, my goal to spend lifetimes to achieve a womanist consciousness, uh, my, my goals to really stretch my spiritual practice from righteousness to ratchetness. Um, in the ways that I really want to love black people. And in loving black people, that becomes like my ground zero. Ah, I get it, grounds it. Anyway, um, <laughs> it becomes like this, this, this point, right, of projection uh, where the more I love black people, especially in this experience, um, and in this context, or a variety of contexts, it just helps me, it really like, helps me build a skill set to love other people. So there's a perception that black love is about excluding, and then I'm steeped in black cultural practices, and I, and I can see how porous they are, and how giving they are, and how generative they are, and so it helps me recalibrate in, in, in respect to this practice of just like sticking to loving myself and loving my divine reflection that I see in the people in my family that are around me, uh, bringing it into you know, uh, an institution like this, very clear about staying dedicated to this, not putting that on pause when I go to quote unquote work, and then when I go out b back into the real world, I can then continue this love, no. Um, and so these, these are some of the thoughts that came up for me at least this morning. If, if I were to do this tomorrow, there might be some other things. But the spiritual practice for me, just in a nutshell, is really about honoring myself, honoring like the moment being present, like really being present with people. Sometimes being present with people means that you challenge them without saying a word, just by showing up. Sometimes it is verbal challenge. Sometimes it's shutting up and just listening and being challenged and feeling challenged. Um, and what I really love about that is, is the stretching. So as we go back through some of the things that I just shared for you is like vulnerability is part of my spiritual practice, like really embracing vulnerability, like giving it that sweet grandmama hug. Um, have you guys ever had someone, have you ever been in a, in a, in a state and, and someone wants to give you a hug and you resist it a little bit? Have you guys ever, yo, I feel like I'm talking to myself up here. <laughs> what the flip, who hurt you? <laughs> Speak, God dog it. Has anyone ever had a hug? They like bring it in, and you're like, no, bring it in. Uh uh, uh uh. I see you back there. Bring it in, bring it in. You're like, no. But here's the funny part. You're like, no, and they're right there, and they have their arms wide open. You're like, no, no. <laughs> that type of embrace. Um, I guess we could just go to question and answers. I probably can go from there, yeah. Or I could sing another little ditty. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh. So I have never met you. I didn't even get to meet you before. We, you know, uh, I was like, met today. Yo, that outfit is banging. You were Thank like, who you. are you? And you rolled in on your scooter. <laughs> That's actually Jakeevis' scooter. I can't take um, credit. I was late. So oh, I was really? Like, Jakeevis, can I borrow that? Yeah. That's the way to roll. Um, but um, I was talking to Dean Varun Sony, the uh, Dean of Religious Life, and we were just sort of thinking about, um, yeah, I wonder what he's going to bring up today. And of course, what I got from Dean Sony, him being married to someone from South Africa, is that you actually do have uh, a bit of history, I think, perhaps in your study or in your work. Um, and I was. 
I guess it's coming up in my mind because a lot of our students are not going to be able to travel this year. They're not going to be able to go abroad. A lot of them are coming back. But how important that was in your personal formation and even in your, um, your self-love that you're speaking of today. Um, maybe you could tell us a bit about that. Yeah, sure. So after I graduated from UCLA way back in the day, um, I had this really extra black moment, this really extra crispy black meditation. And I remember this is, I'm not, I'm not even making this up. I remember thinking, you know what? I ain't asked these fools for me to be here. And I'm not paying to get back to Africa. They're going to pay. Somebody's going to pay for me to get back to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I started looking at ways that would fund my trip back to Africa. And I had fallen in love with um, one of my professors at UCLA. His name is Mazisi Kunene. And, and it's the type of like crush where you're just annoying. Like, I, bless his heart. I wasn't even going to my guidance counselor. I didn't know what credits I really needed to graduate. I just kept taking his class, whether I needed it or not. Um, then I would go to office hours and like, you know, file papers just to be around this man. Um, and he is from the Natal region of South Africa. And he wrote Emperor Shaka the Great, which there was several years ago, there was a film called Shaka Zulu based off his book. He also wrote the, the Zulu anthem. He translated the Zulu, not anthem, excuse me, the Zulu creation story into several different languages, English being one. And it's called Emperor, um, it's called Anthem of the Decades. And it's this epic sort of poem, it's really gorgeous. And I remember saying, hey, Baba, I, I, I think I want to go to South Africa. And he was like shuffling these papers in his office. I was like, <clears throat> hey, Baba, I think, um, I think after I graduate, I'm going to go to South Africa. He's like, nah, I don't go to South Africa. And I was like, but you're from South Africa. What are you talking about? He's like, no, I want you to experience Africa. Go to Zimbabwe, go to like these other places. Don't go to South Africa right now. And the reason he said that is because South Africa was still under apartheid. And he had been in exile for, at that time, 20 plus years. And I think for him, he hoped that I would see the South Africa that he knows. And that was the South Africa under you know, the auspices and under the care of the people that lived there before the settlers came. And I didn't listen. Dang it, I didn't listen. I went anyway. I found somebody to pay for it, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> um, and it was one of the most life-changing experiences I ever had. One, I went with a religious organization, uh, the United Methodist Church, had uh, what they call a mission internship program, a mission intern program. And it was created under the division of the women's and children's division of the, the church. So I'm giving you all these little details because it says a lot, right? Um, just about how fly women are. Um, and I remember the first, after applying and then going to interview in New York, doing all the psychological testing, which was crazy. I was like, they either think I'm crazy or they think I'm going to go crazy or both crazier. Um, the first thing they said to us, and this was like in my heart of hearts without my, my fear, missionaries have done so much damage in so-called third world countries. Uh, in Africa, they say that the missionaries came with the Bible and left with the land. Um, and so I had a lot of internal conflict. But the, the mission intern program was about service. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, yes. They are like, we'll need you being evangelical. We'll need you telling nobody about Christ in them. We need you to go serve. And I was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. I'm ready. I thought I was ready. I got to Soweto, South Africa. And 
literally 10 minutes in, Baba, who's like my father there, um, said something to me in Sutu. And I was like, oh, it was either Sutu or Osa, I can't remember. And I was like, he's like, they, you didn't do any language training? They didn't prepare you? And from that point on, it was like, what am I going to do with this little American kid? Because he had this project, and I ended up doing a variety of different things. And then I broke from the, are we recording this? I broke from the church and did my own thing. So I worked with the University of S South Africa. They had a, uh, psych uh, a team of psychologists going into a variety of different townships, but the one they were focused on were in groups that were classified colored. And in that experience, the idea of, of an essentialist type of blackness or Africanness was shattered forever. Like there's no, it's like that really beautiful crystal that I held that was thrown on the floor in a lot of different pieces that I could never put back together again. Because the word colored in the context of South Africa was different than what my grandmother would refer to herself as. Um, the way groups were divided in that country. And then, you know, just to be very transparent with you all, I went to South Africa to be African. When I was in Soweto, people thought I was, you know, a local boy. When I would go into Johannesburg, people would speak to me in Afrikaans. And I said, yo, why are people speaking to me in Afrikaans? Oh, they think you're colored. And I remember in that place in my identity, I didn't want to be seen as colored. I want to be seen as African. And through the work with UNISA, which was around interpersonal violence, I learned to embrace, not necessarily being colored, because that's not what I am, but like embrace them as an extension of the African family and come back to the reason I went was to be of service. Yeah, and I didn't go to church, but two times there. And my father there was a minister. And this is the best thing. It was Christmas. I'll never forget this. It was Christmas. And you know how you guys woke up today? And you're like, oh, about your business? That's what it was like there. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> there was no one like, I need to get the Chewy doll. I can't get the Chewy doll. Or, oh, if she doesn't get me the... It just was like such a breath of fresh air. And I remember looking, and we went to church, and they said a couple little things about Jesus and them. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. This is amazing. Like, you guys are just in it in a totally different way, like outside of the commercialization of the, of the holiday. And that changed my life forever. Meanwhile, my mom still asked me if I'm going to church. She literally just asked me last weekend. I was driving. Hey, Mom, how you doing? Just checking in. What's going on? How you doing? She's like, oh, OK, where you coming from, church? No. <laughs> she was like, well, that's an answer. <laughs> I love it. But that's also really part of my spiritual practice. I, I, I feel that one of the greatest examples of Christ has been my mom. This woman has been bout it, bout it my whole life. I wanted to lie on my, I can still remember this, I wanted to lie to get financial aid when I went to UCLA. I was like, yo, but I heard if you just change the zero here, my mom was like, no, we will not be doing that. And I was like, but then you wouldn't have to pay it. She, we will not be doing that. And there's been so many instances, which I think are really tied into just my desire to, to live a life of integrity. Um, any other questions? Oh, you got me. <laughs> you got me, Tessa. She scratched her nose, but I got all excited. I was like a little puppy. I was like, <gasps> any questions? OK, we have one here and one there. I'm going to go here first. <laughs> you speak about your mom. Mm. Can you tell us more about your family as you grew up and how you think it affected the person you are today? Sure. I, um, 
most of my growing up until about 17, I grew up in a place called Lompoc, California. And uh, I'm gonna, that's a whole nother story. Um, you guys know Lompoc, California? Anybody ever heard of it? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's a small town in Santa Barbara County. That's a little bit northwest of, so if you've ever been to Solvane or Buellton, whatever, you kind of take that hard left toward the, the shore. And there's an Air Force base there. Um, I'm really selective about how I vote or when I vote. Uh, I really believe in strategies. Um, I'm still trying to become an enlightened being and not be frustrated with superficial talk around politics, especially in this country. Did you see the way Elizabeth Warren was wearing that Ty, I'm voting for her. I'm like, huh? Or <laughs> Donald, Donald Trump kicked the puppy. I could never vote for him. You know, like that sort of superficial stuff. I like, I really like to dig in. Um, and a lot of that has to do with my time in South Africa right before the elections. Um, but my mom and my dad, my dad's a PK, a preacher's kid, were serious about church. And it, had my parents not gone to church when I was in Lompoc, California, I would be a different person. Because the institution of the black church became such a beautiful bubble for those of us that were like in the minority. Like my fam, like this is my extended, like in that tradition of extended family, everything was around church. Now, mind you, the only day we were not at church was Monday and Thursday, usually. So when I say we were at church, we were at church. And the investment, just bringing these parallels, the investment wasn't in about, wasn't about uh, a performance of righteousness or holiness, it was really about service to community, sustaining community, building community. And so my mom's and my father, my father has to just tag along because my mom's like a force to be reckoned with. Um, her service is we always had people living with us. So-and-so wasn't doing well, they're moving in. Sister so-and-so is not doing well, they're moving in. And so this has informed, so when I think about church, I think about this. I don't think about this sermon. I don't think about the suit that I may have worn. Um, I really think about this dedication to service and within this sort of bubble. And it was in Lompoc, funny enough, is where I fell deeply, deeply in love with black folks and definitely in love with black Southern people. Our minister was from Oklahoma, like uh, my dad's from Atlanta, my mom was born in South Carolina, grew up in DC. So there's like this, you know, this real interesting regional feel, feel to the church that kind of dominated, even though we have people from all over the country. And the reason we had black people from all over the country that went to this church is because my dad was in the Air Force. So the Air Force brings a lot of young people and people coming from different places. And my mom worked at the prison. So that's the reason I talked about, you know, voting. Yesterday, there are certain things about prison reform that matter to me because of the way I grew up and my mom. My mom would bring, like, when there was just that, she would bring inmate to them. Or when we go up to the prison, it's now a, a maximum security, but it used to have, be a, a different sort of configuration. Um, you could hear the inmates go, hey, hey, Ms. Grimes. Hey, that's Miss Motom Grimes. They just call her Motom Grimes because what she did is she had to make sure at one point, make sure that you didn't do a day over or a day under. And she'd always mess with my mom was so hardcore. She'd be like, why don't y'all never say less time, Grimes? <laughs> when you get out of here earlier because I did what I need to do, but it's always, you know, so it's, it's interesting. My, parent, my family is amazing, uh, amazing. I just performed in D.C. where my mom grew up. And I forced my kids to go. Uh, so my wife and kids, we all go to D.C. And at one point, uh, after the first show, I asked my family to stand up. It was like 70 people. It was so many people that this 
organization was afraid that no one would come the next life. They're like, can you can your family come back again? <laughs> um, and it was the last time I saw my brother. So, yeah, the journey continues. So my my brother, who's a year younger than me, literally the last time I saw him, he's since passed away. Any other questions? There was a question. Yeah. <laughs> Is this thing on? I have a loud voice. Um, so you talked about uh, vulnerability, and that can be scary. So how do you remind yourself to be vulnerable? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I have to remind myself to be vulnerable. I think what I do is, I think what's important for me to acknowledge the feeling my, when I feel vulnerable. You know, it's like, oh, the reason you are procrastinating or the reason you keep telling jokes or the reason is because you feel vulnerable. So it's really important for me to recognize that and to like really live in it and embrace it. Um, because I think that there are certain strategies that have grown out of that for me that have helped me grow when I'm intentional about embracing it and when I think about it as part of my spiritual practice, my way of being in the world. Um, and then I talked uh, about any sort of work I've been doing, creative work that's in, really invested in following my curiosities around uh, how masculinity is constructed, and so part of that practice is also to allow myself to be vulnerable, because I would have to say there's a lot of conditioning for me personally around not being vulnerable um, in a certain sort of performance of manhood or masculinity. Um, and that vulnerability shows up, so if I'm in dance, like just allowing myself to do this. Right, to, to have a break at the hip. Or earlier I did that, most people won't know me to be happy, but never, right, a break in the wrist. So how, how it affects my body, um, how it affects how I, I'm a parent. So I have two sons and one daughter. So do I want to replicate certain harmful ideologies with my sons? Absolutely not. Uh, what I also learned is that I am but one voice <laughs> and there's a world that is giving them a lot of other information. Do I want to replicate that with my daughter? You know, like, if you want to be super vulnerable, have kids. <laughs> like, for real. Um, and just not pretend that I know everything, because I don't. And I definitely have had elders in my family that they, they live their lives kind of holding to that, that they know, not necessarily everything, but there's no vulnerability. And I'm not interested in replicating that. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, I think we're about short on time. So um, I just want to say thank you. Thank and, you. And on behalf of your Trojan family, uh, we got you a little book. Hey. So you can continue to document what matters to you and why. So let's give it up for Sabella. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate you. Peace. <laughs>